Okay, so uh, welcome. Um, today's discussion um, will be building on this uh, theme um, that we've been following for the past several sessions uh, regarding universal constructions uh, and their combination, um, building up uh, larger um, or, or constructions uh, that reflect interaction of, of multiple such constructions. Uh, we've seen uh, product, uh, co-product, initial objects, terminal objects, and we've seen some how they interact. Um, and uh, we're going to be taking this um, kind of in two directions uh, today, as time allows. Uh, it may be that the latter of them gets left till uh, till our next session on Friday. Um, so the two directions are as follows. Firstly, um, there's uh, another uh, very important um, universal construction that uh, not only uh, is kind of of a cloth with the ones we've been discussing, products and co-products. Um, not only does it link very neatly in with them um, as part of an integrated story, um, uh, typically it's combined with them in uh, the second direction we'll be going. So we really need it. So the first direction will provide the final missing part of the foundation to explore the, the second topic. So uh, the first topic is this issue of exponential objects. Um, and exponential objects have the kind of flavor of, um, of being kind of an iterated product, right? That's, that's what happens when you iterate a product, you get an exponential. You have A times itself and you get A squared. There's the exponential. Multiply it by itself again, you get A cubed. Um, and and it's through iteration of product, get this kind of exponential out. And um, uh, this will be reflected in some of the, the category theory involved. But um, we're gonna see that, that exponential objects uh, play a, a quite important role when it comes to computer science side as well, um, in the form of, of uh, pointing us to currying and uncurrying. Uh, as operations of great significance. And we'll take a look at, actually take kind of two perspectives on um, exponential objects as examples of universal constructions. Uh, and uh, that work will highlight both the kind of category theoretic um, side of it and the, uh, the functional programming side. Uh, now, uh, building on that, we'll then be talking uh, to transition to talk either later today or, or on Friday um, to, about algebraic data types. Now, algebraic data types take a lot of ideas that have been kind of bubbling up in our discussions. For example, this combination of product, you know, of any object with, with uh, the terminal object one um, gives something that's, that's basically the same as the original object. So if you multiply A times one, you basically get something the same as A, uh, where the same as uh, means say in the context of set or in the context of, um, uh, of, of Hask, um, this pseudo, pseudo category we use to model Haskell, um, we have something that's isomorphic. And it's the same information. It's essentially, for all intents and purposes, it's the same thing. It's just a re kind of reworking of it. It's in a different shape, kind of. Um, and um, similarly, when we have co-product with initial um, or product with initial, et cetera, we saw it these kind of exhibit these properties that are algebraic and, and connotation um, and sort of combine them. And it turns out we, we could take that much further. Um, and with product and co-product, you can do a lot of interesting things. You know, you can have 
uh, C, you know, A times B plus C being A times B plus uh, A times C, uh, for example, and, and get these familiar identities that just, you know, flow out of all this. But uh, it gets even more interesting when we get to the exponential object and weaving that in and what's called Cartesian closed categories, meaning any, any morphism and has to be a function has an object associated with it. In, func in, in Haskell, that would be, you know, if we have a, a, a morphism, a, a function between say into Boole, um, the object associated with it would be uh, the object denoting the type int to Boole, in other words, int to arrow Boole, um, that kind of describes the possibilities for this morphism. Um, and algebraic data types uh, provide this incredibly rich, powerful, and functorial sort of um, some very flexible uh, characterization of types that provides us these principal type systems, which have all sorts of nice properties and where we kind of auto automatically get um, this nice feature of functoriality where they can kind of use, be used to lift things which operate at particular types to lift them instead to operate on these potentially quite complex, um, even recursively defined data types. So that's where we're going um, between today and, and Friday, probably. Um, but uh, we have some work to do on the, uh, the exponential side. And uh, it, it is to that end that I'd like to uh, churn here. Um, We've been sort of circling around the possibility of this, and I think we'll uh, we'll turn to um, to exponentials uh, right away. There is some kind of cleanup work I'd love to do on products and co-products, particularly to to show that they're associated with bifunctors, um, and uh, I think we'll return to this at some point. Uh, but. Um, it was the choice David Spivak also made to sort of um, go light on that uh, to, to make sure that we have time to cover exponentials. So I'm gonna um, share my screen here and uh, we'll get going. Okay. Um, so uh, in the sphere of exponentials, um, we're turning to the final universal construction. Now, a lot of the um, associated discussion of this within uh, class, within the context of programming and categories lecture seven, which has been our point of focus, whoa, um, has lain in, um, in, in following this analogy, this programming analogy, this analogy associated with the, the category Hask. Um, and um, the goal here is to lend um, intuitions uh, while recognizing that some of the specifics will be different in an arbitrary category. And um, the kind of general flavor that, um, that David, is, David Spivak tried to, to offer uh, for, for what an exponential is drew on the sort of um, uh, the the ideas uh, coming from our previous uh, previous um, coverage of products and co-products. So the idea was um, products form kind of the one-stop shop, as it were, um, for for maps into two objects, say say A and B. We have these projection maps, right? down to these objects. And, and those projections are mediated by product, um, we saw. Product is, is, is kind of the least upper bound in a monoidal category and, uh, excuse me, ugh, in a pre-order category. And it's, it's this object which mediates, which factorizes other maps. We can express an arbitrary map into a, types A and B or objects A and B through that. Um, through that uh, product. Co-product, we have kind of the reverse. We have these, um, uh, so, so with product that we have these kind of mappings down like this, 
uh, with, with co-products. Instead, we have these mappings out of those two objects. And you know, any other mapping out of them um, uh, can be factorized into a mapping through a co-product. Uh, this happens to show it was with uh, zero, but the point is, um, uh, in general, we can factorize mappings from two arbitrary objects uh, in a category which has co-products through a, a co-product. Um, so it's a one-stop shop for maps out of, of these objects, okay? And, and, and that flavor, what are exponentials? Well, David Spivak says exponentials are one-stop shop for maps with a knob, um, which sounds admittedly um, uh, rather, um, uh, rather florid and um, stretches the imagination. But the idea here is that we have some kind of perimeter setting or knob, which, um, which we adjust only infrequently. And um, we want to retain that while changing an input more frequently to get a given output. Um, and, you know, for those of us who grew up uh, programming um, in our early lives, uh, me before my first year of university, um, in imperative languages, um, uh, we, uh, you know, we would traditionally just kind of carry around the setting. And every time we call the function with an input, we'd pass the setting and we'd get back the output. Um, the setting is just a burden we carry around. It's a, it's a sort of baggage we carry around in order to, to every time give input to get output. Um, and it's just kind of routinized. Um, and then, you know, in my first year of university, I was exposed to currying um, in 6001. And um, I saw this actually a much more beautiful way you can, you can do this. You can close over it, meaning you can create a function. Um, uh, well, you, 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 you basically create a function which first accepts the setting. Um, and or this knob, the value of the knob, say, well, uh, say three. And, and then it returns a function whose job of life it is to map from input to output, knowing the value of that knob. Um, so we've, we've created a closure that remembers this, this value of the knob. The knob is three. And every time this function operates, it knows that knob is three. And it will just take the input to the output using what that, that knob would have been here. And the idea here is that for every function that goes like this, you can convert it into a function that returns a function. Um, and uh, this function that's returned internalizes that knob. Um, and anytime you need it, you can get the output you want just by giving the input. You don't have to go carry this baggage around of the, the setting. Uh, and this is an extremely practical technique um, to the point where it's made its way even to languages like C++ and JavaScript, et cetera. Um, you can you know, close over some information that remembers you know, key objects in the GUI and put it into an event handler. All it is is a function that gets invoked, but it has all the information it needs to do its job. Even in the bowels of any logic, ladies and gentlemen, um, you will find in dynamic, dynamic events uh, the ability to do this. You kind of specify these parameters, um, and then you say basically new event, and it goes and bundles them up and it remembers them. And when that event goes off, maybe it's, you know, you, you at the very beginning, you say, there's going to be a birth event in nine months, and the mother is such and such, and the time of conception is such and such, or what have you. Um, um, uh, and this was the stress level at the mother, you know, um, at the time of conception, or what have you. And then, um, having so done that later, nine months later, when the baby is born, it remembers kind of what that situation was, you know, who's its, it remembers who's its mother, yeah, uh, remembers is its father, uh, which is often more of an issue, um, unfortunately. And, uh, 
and uh, it has all the information it, it knows to do its job. Uh, so, so here um, we, we also have this notion of kind of decoupling some of this information we would otherwise have to carry around as baggage into the birth of that baby, sequestering it away by closing over it, by creating a function that just knows how to do its job. It knows the value of the setting. And by simply evaluating this function, taking its, its single um, input, um, uh, we, we can get back uh, the output we would have gotten if we had waited to specify setting. That's kind of the idea here. It's a map with a knob built in. It, it kind of knows its, its knob. And, and um, this, this is a very practical technique. Um, it's a beautiful technique. And not surprisingly, perhaps, when things are practical and be beautiful, they have a root in category theory. Um, so, you know, the example David Spivak, well, sorry, gave in, in lecture here was, um, uh, was one involving, you know, an addition of two numbers. So here, the setting is the first of the number and the input is the second. And suppose this first setting, you know, it doesn't change that frequently. Um, uh, instead of just always carrying it around, and you know, whenever we get this new number, routinely providing the first one to get the second, we can instead take that number up front, and in a, what's called staged computation, sometimes we we create a function. Um, whose job in life is to do plus three. So if this first number given was a three, we get out a function in life who's, which can be called plus three. Its job in life is to take another number and add three to it. That's this one here, right? So we took our three up front and we created, created a specialized function for that three, which takes inputs and maps them to outputs. And what does this function do? Well, it takes a different number, say five, and it adds three to it to get eight. Or maybe this takes another time 10, and we add three to it to get 13. Or maybe it takes, you know, minus three, and we add three to it and we get zero. Um, the point is we have a plus three function, a function that's specialized to the knob. Um, it's, it, it, it knows its knob. Um, and, uh, it, the knob is hardwired into it, uh, so to speak. Um, and David Spivak noted that this could be written in general, this function returned here uh, could be written as um, naturals to the naturals. Uh, this natural is the, the argument, of course, and, and this natural is the lower base. And this just goes back to, um, you know, the fact that when we have functions from B to A, uh, the number of possibilities for those functions, the number of possible distinct functions goes as A to the B power. And, you know, I find a nice way of forgetting which is at the top, which is at the bottom. As a computer scientist, uh, I could be forgiven, hopefully by my mathematician colleagues, uh, by just remembering, look, um, basically if A is two, this is, specifying a bit sequence for each possible value of B, you specify a bit, right? One possible bit that encodes its value. Um, so we get out a bit sequence. And of course, of course, the number of um, elements of this bit sequence will, will be, there'll be one bit for each B and therefore there's two to the B possibilities. Um, for each possible value of B, there's, um, you know, two to the B possibilities. If B has three possible values, one, two, three, we need a bit for the first value. It's that, you know, if we had B equal um, its first possible value, uh, the result is zero. If we have B equals second possible value, the result is say zero as well. The third possible value for B, maybe we have, you know, the bit being one. Um, there's eight possible encodings of this. Um, Therefore, there's a to the b power. And in general, we write a function as b to the um, b maps to a, kind of in the same way we write a cross b for a product. You think about it, 
A cross B for a product is not merely notation or reflects the fact that there's kind of a punning going on. It reflects the fact that if we have a set A, say with two items in it, a set B with three items, and we create their product, their Cartesian product, A cross B, it has six items in it. And a co-product, if we have two possible items from A and three possible items from B, a co-product, A plus B, has five possible values. It's a tagged union of them. Uh, we know, we remember which value. We don't have to worry about duplicates, you know, not being counted twice. It just possible values of A and the possible values of B. So in each of those cases, we kind of use the mathematical notation that also happens to encode the number of possibilities. Here, this is the number of possibilities. Um, and as David said, if you know A meant three, and this had been uh, two possible values of B, we would have had three to the two's power. And you did some exercises on that early on. Um, okay, um, so this is kind of where we're going and we're gonna talk about some Haskell code for this. But any questions on what I've just talked about, about sort of the, the motivation, this idea of kind of uh, splitting a function up so we can take the information that doesn't change up frequently, you know, uh, just internalize it in a hard coded version of this function, which just remembers this uh, from then on. And then we just have to give it an input or any questions on kind of this idea of mapping and this notation. Questions from the group? Okay, not hearing any to quote Eugenia Chung. We'll plow on. Um, okay. Um, so, um, when we're in a situation where we um, are dealing with Haskell, we have this very nice instantiation of, um, of these concepts of mapping from this function to this one and mapping back. Um, and I would note that the same thing occurs in you know, other programming, uh, functional programming languages, whether it's Scala or whether it's um, Lisp and Scheme Racket or, or other languages. Um, closure, there, there's this very nice ability to curry and uncurry functions. Now, in Haskell, um, which has a you know, formal rigorous type system um, and um, uh, which uses that to very good effect, uh, we're taking advantage of the fact that type, there's a type specifically characterizing functions from B to A. So when we have functions from a object of type int to a type pool, we also have a, um, a type that denotes the, the type of those functions. Um, and this reflects the fact that Haskell mo um, models what's called a Cartesian closed category. Cartesian, because we have products in it, in fact, co-products as well, and closed because these, these morphisms are not you know, outside the, kind of what the language itself can define. It's, it, they don't require kind of outside explication, explanation there. They can be characterized by the objects already in the category. Um, so these morphisms between int and bool can be characterized in terms of their type by a type B arrow A in Haskell. And so it is in, in a closed category, we, you know, the morphisms um, uh, can be described through uh, an object in the category. The Cartesian closed categories are beautiful and they have a lot of these properties we see in Haskell. But with Haskell, you know, we have this further ability to write, write code, right? And, and so here we have the code for Curry. Uh, this is all 
of course, from, from this lecture that we're following. And I, again, I want to emphasize this is really driven out of, out of um, their great work um, in, um, in uh, explaining this in, uh, in this course. Um, so we have Curry, and Curry is of this type. All we're doing is we're putting in two types here um, in the signature, exactly what we were talking about here, but using names that are less, um, perhaps less evocative and less intention revealing than those here, but, but which uh, enjoy the benefits of concision. Um, so here we take an object, oh, sorry, a function, which uh, is itself something that takes a pair uh, of, of two values, one of type A and one of type B. And given that function, through this currying operator, we can turn it into another function, whose, which instead performs the same computation, but first it takes the A um, and then produces a function that takes a B and produces the C in the same way that this would have been with this value of A and this value of B that are given successively. Here we required them up front. Here we required them only in succession. And so we can get a specialized function out this one here. If we give a, a value three, we can get plus three here. And that's exactly what we were doing here, right? This is curry. Um, uh, currying gives us this function which by giving the setting gives us this hardwired, um, hardwired function. And you know you can write it like this, right? Um, curry of F um, equals, it's a function which takes an A, right? And then having taken that A, it returns a function, that's this guy that takes a B, yeah, and applies this original function to it. Um, uh, so whatever this function was to map pairs, we got our pair now. We can build our pair because we have our A, we have a B. And we just build that up and, and call it and we get back our C and life is good. Um, so here, um, you know, we're of course taking advantage of the fact that this function is closed over this A, like it, it knows the value of A that was given here. And even if this is passed back as a function from, you know, we, we do curry F applied to a value three, we get back this function that remembers its A, just as that dynamic event object in any logic remembers who the father is um, and, and uses that information later. Um, okay. Um, so this is Curry F. Now, I, I want to emphasize this is Curry F. Like this is for a particular F, applying Curry to it. This is our F, applying Curry to it. That this gives his function back. So Curry F, if we call it, gives back this function, which when we that can map A's into this this function. Um, that's going to be important in just a minute. Uh, this the fact that Curry F maps A's into functions that remember their A in a way that they can, all they do is take a B, it can be applied. Okay. Um, and then there's uncurry. Uh, and uncurry here was kind of hidden by, by, by this uh, inconvenient um, um, widget. But Uncurry goes the other way. Given one of these functions, we can always turn it into one that kind of expects its input in batch. Taking an incrementally computed function, we can always turn it into one that takes its two, um, you know, its two uh, inputs here. And how do we program that? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, and David uses another syntax. This is a pattern matching syntax. Here he kind of wrote it out in full. But he could have written curry fa here equals this, um, you know, and um, that would have eliminated the need, for example, for this um, uh, quite uh, quite nicely. Um, uh, but here he he has um, you know this function. So we have one of these, 
and we want to get one of those. That's why it's called uncurry. So if we have one of these, how do we get one of these? Well, we have a function that takes these in succession. Um, then basically what we need to do is we need to give it a, a pair, excuse me, a, first we need to give it an A and, uh, and then we need to give it a B. Now this looks, um, um, mm, 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 um, not, not uh, right, okay, okay, um, yeah. Um, okay, um, okay, why, why is this uh, not computing right now? Um, Right, so there's, um, he's written this with this pattern matching syntax involving uh, this. So what, what do we have? Well, um, the thing that's given to us is this function, that's f, right? Um, and so if we give f uh, an a, right. Um, so what we wanna give back is this guy. Um, and uh, we wanna give back something that takes a pair and how are we gonna implement, uh, how are we gonna give this guy back? Well, it's very simple. We have a function that's of this form. And this function, um, uh, when it's applied to an A, will give back a function that can then be applied to a B to get a C, right? Um, so this is what we're given. That's what F is. That's what this F is on which uncurry is called. And, and uh, all we have to do is give it an A and, uh, and get back uh, something that maps a B to a C and then we give it a B and we're done. So if we wanna have this function here um, that takes a pair and gives back a C, all we have to do is do uncurry um, have, an, have here uh, this F and we just, we're just essentially going to uh, provide it, uh, provide these arguments uh, in a way that we give them to this function successfully. So F is this function, we'll give it first A and then we'll give it B and uh, that will give us the C we need. So this is defining exactly this function which maps pairs to Cs through this mechanism. Okay, um, so any, any questions regarding curry and uncurry here or you know how they're expressed here in haskell Okay, so mind you, uncurry f is itself a function, right? Uncurry f is of this type. If we have this as our f, calling uncurry on it gives us this. That's what's going on. So uncurrying f is then applied to a and b um, here. So don't read this as uncurry of f of a comma b in, the, in this pair. Read it as uncurry f. Uh, it may, may help to say, this is what uncurrying of F is. It is a function such that if we give it an A and B, then, um, you know, it's, it's defined in this way. Um, yeah, okay. Um, right. Um, okay, um, so let, let's talk about, um, let's talk about this. Um, so, um, there's two ways that uh, David uh, explained things here, um, or two, two ways that uh, the two videos you've watched have explained things. Uh, the first video um, involving this lecture seven had, um, uh, had this uh, diagram here, which used a commuting square to illustrate this. So here we have Curry F, um, and uh, curry f, you'll recall, is this function, which uh, basically is of this sort. It takes an a 
and it returns a function which hard codes that A, remembers that A, and takes a B and does its job. So curry F is this function. Um, and uh, it'll bear keeping in mind when you look at this diagram that that's what curry F is. So curry F's job is to map from an A into a uh, something of type B to C. Um, that's exactly what's what's shown here, right? So Curry F knows how to map A's into uh, B to C's, which we could write as C to the B. Um, okay, so if if that's what Curry F does, um, and if we're given an, a pair here, uh, A cross B, the universal property associated with exponential objects is of this form. If we have uh, a pair A and B, um, we have two ways we can, and we have a function which takes this pair uh, and maps it to a C. We can either apply that function, excuse me, this is not, well, it's this phrase for Curry, so I'm gonna call it as if it's a function. In general, um, um, we'll have this diagram here, but, um, but we'll talk about it as a function as if we're in Haskell or as if we're the category of sets. So here, if we have an A cross B, we have a function that can map A cross Bs to C, we could apply that. Alternatively, we could perform Curry F on that function um, uh, using A as an argument. So if we have this A in this pair, by applying Curry F to it, Curry F is a function that takes an A and maps it to a B to, to a C or a C to the B. Um, we can turn this A that we were given in a pair into a C to the B uh, or a function from B to C in other words. And the second one we won't map, uh, we won't change, we'll just keep our B. So if we're handed a pair like this, using Curry F, we can turn it into one of these. In other words, we, we return back a function who remembers the knob A and whose job in life, whose job in life is to map Bs to Cs in light of that knob setting A. So that's what this function is here. Um, it has remembered the A that was that was uh, used to produce it, whence it came, just like the dynamic event remembered its father at the time of the birth. Um, uh, here, we, uh, we remember the A that gave birth to this, okay? Or that, that was involved in producing it. Um, so that's Curry F's job in life. Remember, we saw that as early, uh, we saw it here, um, Curry F, takes an A and can map it over. And we saw it here with currying. We could take this and then we have this function. This is our B to the C. Um, um, excuse me, or, or C, to, C to the B here, right? Uh, C to the B, yeah. Um, C is the final product. Um, so, so Curry F's job is to map A's to the two, um, uh, things that map B to C's, and that's exactly what's going on here. So this is written C to the B, but it's, it maps B to a C. Okay, and then we have the special eval function, which is always available. And what, <laughs> how David phrased it is that this function is, and I like his phrasing, he said, this is the universal knob, uh, the universal knob. Uh, is is a knob that's a function because eval's job in life is to just take its knob its function shaped knob and to apply it to its second argument so rather than having a function that you know remembers a piddly old int um as its first argument um eval has a function as its first argument which it then applies to its second argument to get a C. 
Because remember, this function that was produced remembers it's A. You know, it knows who its daddy is and uh, it remembers it's A. And therefore, it has the A part of its information given a, this, this B map from B to C. And given a B, it can complete its job and produce a C. Um, so eval is this kind of, it has this ability to take a universal knob and, and apply that knob to an argument, to its you know, remaining argument to get back a C. And any function, for any function and for any type A, um, uh, we can use curry to do this trick to produce a function which maps from Bs to Cs. And in general, if we have a category and F is not necessarily a function, but it's a morphism, um, and we have this um, unique for, for any F and for any A, object A, um, we have this uh, unique mapping uh, where for each F, we have a unique mapping like this. Um, uh, and, and then we have a, a kind of distinguished morphism as part of the, the exponential object, um, then we have ourselves an exponential object, a nice exponential object. Um, that's, what, um, that's what this is. The pattern of the exponential object means if, uh, that it's such that for any F and for any A, uh, we have the ability to, to perform this. Um, and and uh, this will then constitute this part of the, the exponential object. This is one-to-one -one mapping between F and this um, morphism H. F in general is a morphism. So um, this was how it was explained in lecture. Any questions about that before I talk about sort of uh, an explanation which came, was inspired more by Bartosz? Um, in which explicates this in a little bit of, of additional detail. Any questions about this? Question? Oh, this has to commute, of course. It, it has to be, well, if you go this way or this way, it's the same. That's, that's the property that has to hold for all F, for all A. This is one-to-one -one correspondence here, and, and this diagram has to commute. What does this double bar mean, anyone? What does that mean? Mathematicians love this double bars. And for the first, <laughs> first 55 years of my, no, not 55 years, I, 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 not that old. Um, uh, for the first, you know, 50 or so years of my life, I didn't know what it meant. Um, like why well, did show, I just thought it was an arbitrary piece of notation. Do you know what this is? <laughs> Do you know what that is? It's a really funny thing. Is it? The equal sign? It's the equal sign. <laughs> yeah, mathematicians just love writing these distended equals. This is a long equals as well. Um, yeah, you got to love mathematicians. Um, uh, so uh, that's a long equal sign, and they'll write it vertically sometimes. Yeah. So this is really a triangle. I mean, if you really think about it, these are really the same vertex. And so Bartosz shows it like this. He says, okay, well, um, and I've tried to re-change his notation and so on to be consistent with the Spivakian treatment, okay? Um, and um, to keep it kind of as one-to-one as, -one, uh, as possible. Uh, so here, what we have, and I'll try to clear the widget away to not obscure, um, the diagram. So here, what we have is we have uh, an A and a B. Um, 
that we can map into a C with an F. But remember, this is not actually specific to this being a function. It, it's kind of nice to think about it in terms of your training wheels to think about this for functions, but this is true for, for any category. Um, um, so uh, F is a morphism, okay? Um, and uh, we have this, this object, um, we have a morphism going from that object to a C. Um, what does it mean to be an exponential uh, in such a category, arbitrary category C? Well, um, if we have an uh, arbitrary category C, if we have an object that itself starts with a product, um, and you may say, well, wait, where was that product in that diagram? It was right here. He just didn't write this as a product. Uh, he wrote these two product differently. Um, he could have written this as A comma B as well. Uh, these are both products, okay? So here's our product. Um, and you notice this is the upper part of this diagram. This is the lower part. Um, F is this upper thing here, and it's going to C. Um, if uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence here um, uh, between H from A going from A to the to this function that remembers A but maps B's to C's, um, that function is A or not function morphism H. Um, uh, if if there's this there's this object that has unique morphism. Um, for every F you give it, there's a unique morphism from A cross B to C to the B cross B, um, uh, then that's this guy here. This is C to the B, what we're calling C to the B. Um, um, it's, you know, in, in, in Haskell it'd be of, of this type, this is the C to the B. Um, if, if we have this, uh, this unique H for every F such that this diagram commutes, this, this diagram is commuting, um, uh, that, well, sorry, for, and that's true for every A and for every F, um, we, we get a commuting diagram like this. Uh, then, then this is, we could call it the exponential object uh, here uh, associated with um, with this this category. And I don't know if I'm um, quite expressing that correct, but this pattern characterizes the exponential object here. Um, so um, th this characterizes what the exponential object is. So the exponential object B, you know, C to the B is such that this is the product with it with B. Um, and an H maps from A to it, okay? Uh, and uh, this property has to hold for, for this triangle, which involves that exponential object crossed with B. The re you know, we put these in boxes showing it's B crossed with this. This one is A crossed with B. So we kind of, per David Spivak and Brendan Fong's sort of nice uh, showing of Cartesian products. We have one thing being multiplied here, one thing up here. We have the Cartesian product kind of being the, kind of the joint thing involving them. So it's kind of like a, just like a multiplication square, right? That's kind of what this is. Okay. Um, and so this, uh, this will be the the uh, exponential object um, if we if we have that. Uh, I think uh, I'm, I may be glossing over some details here, um, but this has to hold for all f and for all a. Uh, there exists a unique h such that this uh, commutes. Then we have this exponential object uh, for a given for a given b and uh, a given a given c. And the exponential object can be taken as kind of representing these mappings or these um, 
functions for for set and hask. Um, um, it has this kind of flavor of evaluation or, or um, connoting a mapping. And again, that's why we call it Cartesian close because we can denote maps from B to C, like morphisms from B to C uh, in such a category where we have an exponential object are kind of associated with it. If you have a morphism from object B to object C, um, it's kind of associated with this, uh, this object, which, which kind of characterizes its type as it were. This is the exponential object. Um, why? Because it meets this property. Um, so it kind of serves to indicate mappings within the category, objects that connote mappings within the category from B to C are denoted as C to the B. And they and, and it serves that flavor. And as we'll see with algebraic data types, it very much has um, a role in the algebras very much like this. And it has a role in intuition very much like this in terms of some of the examples and how it manifests in set and task. It, it's like a function object going from B to C because that's what it represents in the category. It represents a mapping from B to C. Okay, any questions on this? This is a, a lot of pretty dense stuff here, but any questions on it? Somehow this went off. This um, oh man, now, now we're really in trouble. Um, this knob is, is this guy, um, and this is the universal. The universal knob is this one. Um, now we're out of space. Um, here we go. Um, this is the universal knob. It um, it's no no ordinary knob it's a knob that that's a function and eval takes that extraordinary knob and can apply it to an arbitrary b and that's what that makes that an extraordinary thing it's the exponential object for b to c it's, it's this kind of super thing well i'm exaggerating but it's a it's a pretty nice thing um that it's this universal knob that can map B's to C's. Questions about this? Oh my gosh, okay. Already at the time, okay. Question? Okay, well, um, we didn't get to our algebraic data types, um, but we've seen exponentials, we've seen products, we've seen coproducts, we've seen initial objects, and we've seen terminal objects. Um, this is all material I skipped in the discussion group that we had um, in late 2020 and early 2021. Um, but now you are equipped to really understand algebraic data types, um, because algebraic data types beautifully take these concepts and apply them in practical ways for data types. And they take us out of a, a kind of a mental model of types as kind of ways to represent data and memory um, and kind of, you know, jury rig type systems um, to instead, infuse the rigor of our typing with the rigor, infuse our typing with the rigor of mathematics. And we get all sorts of wonderful properties, um, both in terms of rigorous understanding, the ability to lift functions that operate in particular values to, to operate on these complex data types, um, the ability to, to reason about them uh, with clarity to avoid writing certain code. And um, uh, these, provide us um, clarity of, of thinking 
when it comes to successively composing uh, elements of our program. So we will uh, be seeing that on, on Friday. Now, if you didn't get a chance to look at the functoriality one, um, um, I would say, recently speaking, we're going to have our hands full going through this, but it wouldn't be bad for, um, you know, to, to do an add on watching of that at some point, I will probably mention that they are functorial, meaning you can lift functions to operate on these complex data types. Okay. Um, uh, functions that operate on, on standard values. Um, okay, great. Um, so that's all for today. Uh, and if anyone wants to come to the applied category theory in scientific computing, uh, either starting today or starting at a later session, let me know and I'll provide you the requisite information and let the organizers know we'll, we'll be having some additional attendees. Thank you.